Welcome. <laughs> I am Johannes Bochermann, the esteemed but most humble president of the great Synode von Dordrecht. I'm also a domine in the Church of Leibaden in the most wonderful province of Friesland. I've come today to give you a tour of the most significant synod of the whole Dutch Reformed tradition. And I was there at the helm. This venerable synod has just concluded mere 400 years ago 
So my memory of events is still very fresh. The occasion for the Synod. The Synod of Dort of 1618 and 19 was convened at the Dutch city of Dordrecht, primarily to settle the Armenian controversy that had agitated the Netherlands for about 20 years. The controversy centered on the teachings of Jacobus Arminius about his views of predestination and related points. Now the controversy rose in the 1590s when Arminius was pastor of the Church of Amsterdam and it became more heated when he became appointed the professor of theology at Leiden University in 1602. There he clashed with his colleague Franciscus Comares. After Arminius died, his followers drew up a remonstrance in 1610 that summarized Arminius's views in five articles. Now because of the 1610 remonstrance, the Arminians became known as remonstrants. Their five articles were at the heart of the controversy as it escalated all the way to the Synod of Dort. The controversy spread from the university to the churches and even to broader Dutch society, so much so that even the fishmongers in the market at Leiden were arguing over predestination. That also became entangled in political issues so that the country was even on the verge of a civil war with Johann Oldenbarnevelt supporting the remonstrance and Prince Smoritz of Orange supporting the contra-remonstrance or orthodox reformed cause. Now in a sense, the outcome of the remonstrant case was determined already in the political arena. When Prince Moritz in the summer of 1618 disbanded the local militia in several Dutch cities and arrested Olden Barnevelt, he replaced pro remonstrant political officials, officials with officials who supported the contra-remonstrant cause. Nonetheless, in spite of the political intrigue, our venerable synod was determined to give the remonstrance a fair hearing and a fair judgment. Now, National synods were supposed to be held every three years. Our venerable synod of Dort was the first national synod to be held in 32 years since the Synod of The Hague in 1586. That was because of complications in the relationship with the Dutch government, which took on itself the authority to convene national synods. So the Synod of Dort was convened by the Dutch government, the high and mighty States General in The Hague. In November 1617, the States General approved 17 articles to convene the Synod. These articles provided the mandate for the Synod and determined its parameters. The States General paid most of the expenses of the Synod, including the travel expenses, a room and board, and a daily stipend for the foreign delegates for a whole six and a half months. It cost the States General well over 100,000 guilders. The Dutch provincial synods had to pay the expenses for their own delegates, participants at the synod. This was a national synod 
of the Dutch Reformed churches, but it was a synod with an international character, as is evident from the participants. First, there were 11 Dutch delegations at the Synod. Nine of these delegations were sent from nine Dutch provincial synods. Most of these provincial synods sent four ministers and two elders. Almost all of them contra remonstrance. Since the remonstrants were in a minority everywhere except in Utrecht. The Walloon or French Reformed churches in the Netherlands also sent a delegation. And there was a separate delegation of five theologians from the various Dutch universities and academies. Second, since it was considered necessary to seek the help of Reformed theologians from other countries to deal with the Arminian controversy, there were 28 foreign theologians present at our Venerable Synod. They were from eight foreign countries where there were strong populations of Reformed churches. And you see them there, Great Britain, the Palatinate, Hesse, four Swiss cantons, Nassau, Geneva, Bremen, and Emden. Now the head of the British delegation was an Anglican bishop, George Carlton. He was the only bishop at the whole synod. To show him proper honor, we built a canopy there over the British delegation. The States General also invited foreign theologians from France and Brandenburg, but they could not attend. The theologians from the French churches were on their way, actually, but unfortunately, the French king prevented them from coming. But to show deference to the French, we left their seats open beside the British. The foreign theologians were given not only the right to deliberate, but full voting rights along with the Dutch delegates. Third. There were also 18 state delegates representing the States General. Their role was to give direction on procedural matters and to ensure that the Synod did not impinge on political affairs. They did not enter into the theological issues, and they certainly, but they certainly had a lot of influence on procedure. Fourth group of participants at our Venerable Synod were not actual delegates. Thirteen remonstrant leaders were summoned to appear before the Synod to explain and defend their views so that the Synod could examine and make a judgment about any views that deviated from the accepted doctrine of the Dutch churches. Leiden theologian Simon Episcopius was their spokesman. Now at the beginning of the Synod, we sent these remonstrant leaders letters of citation requiring them to appear before us within 14 days. These citation letters called them to state, explain, defend their views of the five remonstrant articles and to submit any observations or doubts they had about the Belgian Confession and Heidelberg Catechism. Initially, three remonstrants representing the Utrecht Reformed Synod were seated as regular delegates during the early sessions. Now, the cited remonstrants arrived at the Synod on December 6th, and the agenda immediately turned to the remonstrant theological case. At that point, the two Utrecht remonstrant ministers, with a, a little pressure from me, joined the cited remonstrants. So the number of remonstrants before the synod was raised to 15. They were seated around the table in the middle of the hall there in front of me. Now, as you can see, the seating arrangement in the hall honored the rank of the delegations. 
At the table by the fireplace was my seat, along with the two secretaries and two assessors, or vice presidents. To my right were the state delegates and their secretary. To my left were the esteemed foreign delegates, the British first. Further to my right were the five Dutch theologians and some of the Dutch delegates. The rest of the Dutch delegates were in the seats at the back. For open session, spectators could stand behind the fence at the back or sit up in the two balconies. In the best places, a lot of women and girls and young ladies of high birth were seated who came to take in the spectacle. Now on doctrinal matters, the only standard that was allowed to determine truth was the Bible. That was spelled out already in the government articles to convene the synod. Whatever pertains to the truth of doctrine, the delegates must take care that they shall use the word of God alone as the sure and undoubted rule of faith and not any human writings. On to the phases of the synod. Our venerable synod met for six and a half months from November 13, 1618 to May 29, 1619, a total of 180 half-day sessions. Now, the general proceedings of the Synod consisted of four phases. First, in the pro opta sessions, which lasted for just over three weeks before the cited remonstrance arrived, we focused on various non-doctrinal ecclesiastical matters. Phase two. After the arrival of the cited remonstrance on December 6, the Synod was largely entangled in procedural debates with them for five whole weeks until I expelled them from the Synod. Phase three, after their expulsion, for almost four months, we focused on examining remonstrant writings and preparing the Synod's response to the remonstrant case. Now, based on advice from each of the delegations, the Synod issued its own judgment, the Canons of Dort. Ah, a document so dear to my heart. Phase four. In the post acta sessions after the foreign theologians returned home, the Dutch delegates focused on various matters of relevance to the Dutch churches especially a revision of the church order. Now let's look at each of these four phases. Phase one, the pro acta sessions. From November 13 till December 6, the synod was occupied with opening uh, formalities and addressed a number of non-doctrinal matters. After opening ceremonies at the Kronekerk, we read the credentials of the Dutch delegations and the officers of the Synod were selected. I, Johannes Bogerman, as president, Yo, uh, Jacobus Rolandus and Hermanus Vakelius as assessors or vice presidents, Sebastian de Manus and Festus Homius as secretaries. Since the primary reason for holding the synod was to deal with the remonstrant controversy, we decided to summon a group of remonstrant leaders, so we sent out letters of citation. While we awaited the arrival of the cited remonstrance, the synod addressed five matters that had been forwarded from the Dutch provincial synods. First, since there was a great need for a new Dutch Bible translation, the Synod decided to authorize such a translation and made several preliminary decisions about how the translation would be done. There were decisions about whether to include the apocryphal books and how to refer to God. We selected translators and supervisors, but it was not until 1637 
that this translation, known as the Statenvertaling, or State's Bible, was actually completed. What a masterpiece. And you can actually see it in the room back there. Second, the Synod discussed the topic of catechizing. We drew up several guidelines for catechism preaching, which was sorely neglected in some places. We also addressed how best to teach catechism in the context of the school, the home, and the church. Third, we considered a question that arose in the Dutch colonies in the East Indies about whether slave children who were taken up as part of Christian families should be baptized. We decided that they should not be baptized until they reached the age of discretion. Fourth, we adopted some regulations for the training of students preparing for the ministry in the Dutch Reformed churches. For instance, it was agreed that students should not perform baptism, but it was left to the discretion of the classes whether they should preach in public worship services. Fifth, since there was a concern about that the printing of remonstrant and seditious ideas was not being well regulated, the Synod also addressed the issue of abuses in printing. Most agreed that there was a need for a censorship committee of scholars to approve new publications. Phase two, procedural debates. From December 6, when the cited remonstrants first agree, appeared at the Synod until their expulsion on January 14, the Synod and the remonstrants were largely entangled in five weeks of procedural wrangling that erupted in many forms. I had to manage it all. The fundamental cause of the procedural debates was the fact that the two sides identified the central issue in the controversy differently. For the synod, the issue was the remonstrant doctrinal deviation in their view of predestination, especially their view that God predestined people on the condition of foreseen faith. Now for the remonstrance, the issue centered on the extreme views of reprobation by certain reformed theologians. Since the remonstrants were not delegates, in these circumstances they made every attempt to have reprobation placed on the agenda. They wanted to be assured that they would have full freedom to refute contra-remonstrant views of reprobation and that the synod would declare its judgment on such views. Now, on De December 7, Episcopius delivered a long and tedious speech to explain the motives and backgrounds of the remonstrant position. After the speech, I asked him for a copy. But he said he had no other copy. But then we found out that he had another rough copy. So naturally, I accused him of lying. He strongly denied it. He contended that what he had said was that he had no other copy neatly enough written out. But I never heard him say that, and he was standing there right in front of me. Already when the remonstrants first arrived at the Synod, they raised the issue of the Synod's authority. Episcopius said the remonstrants were ready to have a conference on the points in dispute. I firmly reminded him that the intention of the Synod was not to hold a conference between equal parties. Rather, they were cited before the Synod to have their views judged. Then on December 10, the Remonstrants read a paper asserting that they did not recognize the Synod as their lawful judge because, they said, our members were the opposing party in the conflict, and because many of the Dutch delegates had participated in schisms. They considered it manifestly unjust 
for one party in a dispute to act as a judge. And they demanded that 12 conditions be met before they could recognize the synod. We, of course, rejected the conditions, and I, uh, I reprimanded them for their insolence. The next day, the remonstrance came with a formal protest that categorically rejected the authority of the synod as the legitimate judge of the controversy. We considered their protest and declared it groundless. For the synod, the crux of the issue was whether the church has the right to judge doctrinal views that deviate from the confessional standards. Of course we have the right and solemn obligation to guard the church against false teachings. After the authority question, the main procedural issues revolved around how the synod was to deal with the actual doctrinal questions in the controversy. Of these procedural issues, the most important were whether the remonstrants would be allowed to refute contra-remonstrant views and whether they would be allowed to criticize reprobation freely. After their process, protest, I wanted to get to the real issue, so I asked the remonstrants to present in writing their views on Article 1 concerning predestination. That only raised an argument about whether their citation letters required their views to be presented orally or in writing. Finally, the remonstrants yielded, and they submitted their statement on Article 1 in the form of 10 theses. The Synod immediately complained that these 10 theses negatively re rejected the views of others more than it positive, positively asserted their own views. So I gave them two admonitions. They must affirmatively present their own views. Afterward, they could refute opposing views. And they must keep to the topic of election rather than odiously criticize the topic of reprobation, which I said they could treat afterwards. Four days later, the remonstrants submitted their statements on Articles 2 through 5. And they added a number of reasons for expressing their views negatively and for treating reprobation. Now, the same day, I demanded that the remonstrants produce their observations on the Belgic Confession and Heidelberg Catechism. But this only sparked new debate about whether such Observations should be presented only after the five articles were fully treated. Finally, on the 21st of December, the remonstrants submitted their ob observations on the Belgic Confession, signed by all of them. They insisted that they called into question no doctrine accepted by the Reformed churches. They said, they said they simply presented suggestions for confessional revision. I then reprimanded them for not submitting their observations on the catechism at the same time and for presenting their observations jointly rather than individually. On the 27th, they finally submitted their observations on the Heidelberg Catechism. They were offered in the same spirit as the observations on the confession, just as con suggestions for minor revision. The same day, the remonstrants insisted that for them it was important to their conscience to refute opposing views of absolute unconditional reprobation. Now, in this context, the synod issued a decision that declared that we would examine the remonstrant view not only of election, but also of reprobation, as much as the synod considered sufficient. In this decision, no mention was made of refuting, so the remonstrance, to them, it looked like a step back from my earlier assurances about refuting. On December 28, I began to orally examine the remonstrants by questions that I posed to them individually. But 
This only sparked a new set of debates about the validity of asking questions and the necessity of answering individually. It was so phrasic, frustrating. The remonstrants refused to answer any questions without the freedom to refute. So at this point, the proceedings were locked in an impasse. The next day, the Synod decided to supplement its decision with a further explanation, promising that reprobation would be treated immediately after election, and it conceded to the remonstrance the freedom to refute the views of Dutch counter-remonstrance, but not of other Reformed theologians. Now, in their reply to the Synod, the remonstrants made two concessions. They were willing to answer questions, preferably in writing, after presenting an explanation of their views, and they would let the state delegates set time limits. Now, in spite of these concessions, most of the synod expressed their weariness with the remonstrant actions and advised that if they did not submit, they should be dismissed from the synod and examined from their writings. Now, the state delegates then sent a delegation to the states general in The Hague to report on the remonstrant obstinacy and to receive direction. They returned from The Hague with a resolution from the States General. It approved the actions of the Synod and ordered the remonstrants to submit. If they did not do so, the States General resolved that their opinions should be examined from their writings. Now, after an absence of day, eight days, we recalled the remonstrance on January 11. I tried to examine them one last time. I asked a question from a prepared list, but again, the remonstrance refused to answer, and a debate flared up about whether they should answer questions before or after presenting their own explanations. But then Episcopius made a concession if this freedom to explain, defend, and refute as much as they thought necessary were granted to them, they were ready to receive the list of questions and answer them in writing. But I refused, saying it was not customary to hand over written questions to people who were summoned. Some say, a promising opportunity for a compromise on procedure was now lost, but I, I disagree. Later that day, many of the foreign delegations advised that the list of questions be given to the remonstrants, but the Dutch delegations thought they should be censured and be examined from their writings. By majority, the Synod then decided to examine the remonstrant view of the five articles from their writings as the state's general resolution had authorized. But we still gave them the option to submit till Monday the 14th. On January 14, the state delegates first reported on a private meeting that they had with the remonstrants and that their efforts had all been in vain. Then I called in the remonstrants and asked them to state categorically, yes or no, whether they would obey the States General and Synod. Episcopius replied by submitting a long document that contained their explanation of Article I and a refutation of contra-remonstrant views. The preface again affirmed that the remonstrants could not in good conscience obey the Synod's decrees. Now at that point, I lost patience and I angrily expelled them from the synod in a most passionate speech. I rehearsed the synod's dealings with the remonstrants and accused them of great obstinacy, deceit, and lies. 
Finally, I expelled them with the words, in the name of the state uh, delegates and of the synod, you are dismissed. Get out! Exite! Exite! As they were leaving, I overheard one of the remonstrants say, out from this assembly of the wicked. The response to the remonstrant case. After the remonstrants were expelled, our venerable synod spent the next three months carefully examining their views from their writings and preparing its judgment on the remonstrant case, popularly known as the Canons of Dort. Now, we usually had good discussions, but sometimes the discussions got a little heated. Between the delegates, Professor Gomares got into such a dispute with Martinius of Bremen over the role of Christ in election that he actually challenged him to a duel. And he had to be restrained lest they come to blows. Over the next couple of months, many of the Dutch and foreign theologians gave wonderful speeches on specific doctrinal issues. Meanwhile, the remonstrants continued to submit long and tedious written explanations and defenses of their five articles. We patiently read most of them toward the end now, of February. I have right here the, a copy of one of those originally signed canons. It was such a relief to be done. Soli Deo Gloria. We also added a conclusion to the canons to deal with two things. First, to renounce a number of false accusations the remonstrants had raised against the reformed teaching on predestination. And second, to admonish our pastors and theologians to avoid hard sayings that cause suspicion of our reformed doctrine. Finally, we added a preface to the canons, which introduced this document. After the canons were adopted, this venerable synod drew up a sentence of the cited remonstrance. The sentence deposed them from their offices in the ministry. There were still two more general matters that to be dealt with in this third phase of the proceedings, other discipline cases, and a review of the catechism and confession. We addressed four other discipline cases about the Geesteranus brothers, four remonstrant ministers of Kampen, uh, Conrad Forstius and Johannes Macovius. The case of Macovius, the theological theology professor at Franeker, was a bit different. His theology was orthodox enough, but he had the habit of presenting an extremely scholastic way of teaching. We admonished him to avoid this and to stick with the language of the Bible. Now in this phase, the States General also asked us to review whether the doctrine of the Belgic Confession and Catechism agreed with the Word of God. So we read through the Catechism and Fact Confession and the delegates fully affirmed the doctrine contained in the Confession and Catechism and that they agreed with the word of God. At that point, our focus was on doctrine, not on phraseology. After these matters were dealt with on the 6th of May, we ended the space of the synod at the Chronikerk of Dordrecht in a solemn procession with great pomp. The members of the synod walked two by two from the synod to the church, led by the state delegates following two coaches of ladies. When all the delegates were seated in the Chrodekerk, along with a vast concourse of spectators, men and women of high and low birth, I mounted the high pulpit and read a prayer in the Latin tongue for about a half hour, thanking God profusely for the harmonious outcome of our venerable synod. Then our secretaries, Homius and Demonis, ascended the pulpit and took turns, each reading a chapter of the canons until their voices were hoarse. 
in order to publicly promulgate this blessed document to the whole world. Damanus then read off the names of every delegate who signed the canons, and upon hearing his name, each one doffed his hat. A few days later, we dismissed the foreign delegates with, a ge with generous words of thanks for their willingness to come and help us deal with our crisis here in the Netherlands. Then followed a magnificent banquet. The whole synod was plentifully treated with meat and drink and with agreeable music from voices and strings. Women sang from behind the curtains. The state delegates presented each of the foreign delegates with an expensive gold medal with a picture of the synod. Then the foreign delegates left for home, stopping in The Hague on the way. There, some of them witnessed the beheading of Johann Olden Barnevelt, who was convicted of treason. May God have mercy on his immortal soul. Phase four, the post doctor sessions. After the dismissal of the foreign theologians, the Dutch delegates stayed for another three weeks to deal with matters of concern to the Dutch churches. Then we switched from Latin to Dutch. First, we read the most recent church order of 1586 and approved it in substance. Then we revised it, changing six articles and adding seven new ones. The result was our wonderful church order of Dort. Now, in these post doctor sessions, we also dealt with a number of other matters. We drew up regulations to reform the Dutch universities. We drew up rules for observing the Sabbath. We drew up a new form of subscription for ministers by signing it. They agree that the Belgian Confession, Heidelberg Catechism, and Canons of Dort do fully agree with the Word of God. We revised and approved a new translation of the canons, and we made some changes in the words of the Dutch and French versions of the Belgic Confession. We approved a form for adult baptism, and we drew up a list of requests to the States General, including a request to convene the next National Synod. Now, unfortunately, due to the challenge of church-state relationships, there was not be another Dutch National Synod for 200 years. That makes our venerable Synod of Dort all the more significant. Now, on the 29th of May, our blessed Synod finally ended, again with a procession to the Rode Kerk. Aftermath. The leading remonstrants were banished from the country by the States General. But a few years later, they were allowed to return. About 200 remonstrant ministers were deposed from the ministry in the Dutch Reformed churches. But alas, they soon went on to form their own separate church, the Remonstrant Brotherhood. After the Synod, the official documents of the Synod were gathered together and bound in 17 folio volumes. These were kept in a large kist or trunk with eight locks. Each of the seven provinces had a key as well as the states general. Once every three years, representatives from these eight bodies would come together with their keys to The Hague to open the kist and check the state of the archives for mold or vermin. In 1620, the States General published the Acta of the Synod, but this was a highly edited and politically motivated version of the Acts, acts for international consumption. Whatever did not reflect well on the Dutch nation was either left out or changed. So the official Acta Authentica of the Synod remained unpublished until it finally, finally appeared in volume one of this new series, the Acta et Documenta of the Synod of Dort. Now before I end, let me not forget one more participant of the Synod. There was a devout dog who was so curious 
about the proceedings that he attended most of the sessions. After months of avidly following the intense synodical deliberations, the dork dog was still left scratching his ear. 